So I heard a little rumor about this particular building that this is one of the largest buildings in Manhattan. Maybe by footprint or square footage, it's, it's up in like the top five. And as I was thinking about being here and speaking with you all today, I think it is no coincidence um, that I am speaking with a room full of people who are affecting the world in one of the largest, most significant ways we've ever experienced. And so it is a deep honor of mine to be here with you. I can only imagine, I can't actually imagine, the passion and the talent in this room and what you all are capable of doing in the world. So thank you for having me. Today I'm going to talk about my work and a lot of questions that I'm asking about the world. And if you have any questions after today's talk, if you shoot up in bed at like 1 in the morning and think, oh, I have to ask that one thing, you can find me online uh, at hashtag choose must. Just tag your question or whatever you have with hashtag choose must, and I will, I will find you. I will creep around and find you out there. So as mentioned in the introduction, I, a year ago on April 8th, published an essay on Medium titled The Crossroads of Should and Must. And probably like so many of you here in the room, I share things online every day, all of the time. And the spirit of this post was no different. But something happened with this post that had never happened in anything that I had shared or built or created. Within two weeks, this essay was tweeted to over five million people and read by over a quarter of a million readers. As a designer, the first instinct that overcame me was that of curiosity. What was it about this post? Why were people sharing it? What was it that gave it natural momentum to continue to move through the interwebs? And so I decided to extend this post into a book to answer some of those questions. And on April 8th of 2015, this book was published by Workman Publishing here in New York. And one thing that I want to note that I think is so cool and unexplainable is that it came out exactly one year to the day of the original essay. How does that happen? I don't know, but the universe is amazing. Today, however, I wanted to go back to where it all began. It all started with a dream. Specifically, it was a dream about a white room. There were concrete floors, tall white walls, warehouse windows running this, this wall here, and a mattress on the floor in the back. And in this dream, I would walk in and I would sit down on this concrete floor. And I would be filled from head to toe with the most unbelievable sense of peace. That's it. That was my dream. And I had it over and over again, off and on for months. So one day I'm telling a, a girlfriend about this dream, and she says to me, have you ever thought about looking for this room in real life? Now, I don't know how many of you guys have had a dream and then thought, like, oh, I'm going to go look for all those things in real life. I certainly had never done it. But I was reading a lot of Joseph Campbell at the time, the great Joseph Campbell mythologist, psychologist, incredible human being. And he has this um, philosophy that uh, we all have the opportunity to go on an adventure during our lives, if we so choose. And the first stage of this adventure is the call to adventure, just simply being called, prompted, something in front of us. Um, maybe it might seem a little mysterious or odd. And I began to wonder, well, my dream is mysterious and odd. Perhaps that is my call to adventure. So I asked the question that you need to ask, which is, OK, when you decide to go look for your dreams in real life, where do you go? Where do you start? Craigslist. Craigslist is where I went. And I'll be totally honest, I felt so silly. I felt so silly. I had no idea what I was looking for. I had no idea what I was going to find. I confined the search results to San Francisco because that's where I lived. But I didn't really know what was going to happen. But I had this sense. I had this sense that whatever I was looking for was somehow looking for me too. 
Have you ever had a feeling about something in your life where you just knew it had to happen, where it just felt inevitable? This was what this experience was like for me. So I continued this odd search. Days went by, and one day, I'm scrolling through the ads, and right there, I see it. It is the image, exactly, of the white room from my dreams. And there's an open house the very next day. Of course, of course there would be, right? So I go to this open house, I walk in, I put in my rental application, and I get a phone call a couple hours later that I have received this apartment in San Francisco. Two weeks later, I move in. On my very first night, I decide, OK, well, now that I'm here, I'm going to recreate this moment from my dream, right? That's what you would do. And so I, I go, and I sit down on the concrete floor. It's very strange to be sitting in real life inside of a dream. Every, you know, like kind of the universe is like flexing and folding in this moment. Um, and I sat down on the floor. But instead of being filled with peace, I unexpectedly began to panic. I felt so incredibly vulnerable in this place, um, on this journey that had seemed to have called me to it. And I sat down on the floor, and I began to look around. I began to wonder, what is all this about? What's going on? And really, without any other option, I decided to ask the room. <clears throat> and I said out loud to the room that had called me to it, why am I here? And as clear as day, the room replied. And the room said to me, it is time to paint. I had painted all the time as a little girl. I had painted, I don't know, all through middle school, high school, into college, and I think probably somewhere when I was filling out law school applications, trying really, really hard to go to law school and to become a lawyer, I forgot about my love of painting altogether. And so upon receiving this advice, I woke up the next morning and went to the art supply store. I got my toolkit rebuilt. And I, I like to say, like, I got the band back together again. We came home, and we got to work. This is my studio. This is the white room from my dreams, which is totally not white anymore. It is covered in paint. I worked at scales that deliberately freaked me out, like so many of you who are looking at extremes. Uh, this is my version of extreme testing. Get large pieces of paper that are left outside of the garbage, bring them into your studio, and paint them as quickly as you can. And when big started to get easy and comfortable, I quickly moved to small. These are 100 self-portraits completed in about 100 days as a part of uh, the 100-day project, which we did on Instagram last year. And all of this, all of it, I started sharing on social media. And I quickly learned that, hey, it is so vulnerable and scary to share your work. Because you don't really know what's happening in your work. There's all this stuff that's emerging, and what does it mean, and where is it going? You have a lot of questions. But one thing that I knew for sure is that whenever I was about to post something that I was a little so-so about, I would just find my cute, fluffy white dog, put her right in front of the piece. And everybody likes cute, white, fluffy dogs on social media. So that's a pro tip for anybody else who's sharing your work online. It helps get over the vulnerability. Then something happened that I never could have anticipated. Some friends came over. They collected all of the paintings, all of the drawings. I literally watched a man peel a large chunk of my wall off of the wall as he removed a painting. And they put them in the back of a van, and they drove them across San Francisco and installed them in a gallery space um, in Soma. And this is me on opening night for a one-night pop-up show. Uh, I had received a phone call from the gallery owner who said, I am watching what you're doing on Instagram. What are you doing with all of this work? And I said, well, I'm either painting over it or throwing it away. And she said, stop that immediately. Would you like to install your work for one night? I've got basically one show ending with one artist and another show that's beginning. And I've got three big days in between. Would you like to come put up your work and have an event for one night? And I said, yes, of course. So this is me on the night of that pop-up show. And it is moments before this um, wonderful uh, piece of graffiti art in the back uh, was raised as the entrance to the gallery. I love it. And this is 60 pieces of new work created in about, I don't know, four or five weeks. Some of the pieces were still wet. I was worried that somebody might like lean against a painting and get paint on their clothes. And what I want to highlight about this moment is that this is when I felt that peace. 
this is when I felt that inner alignment that I felt in my dream. And this is before anybody arrived, before I knew if anybody would come, before I knew if anything was going to sell, if anyone was going to like or hate what I had done, before any of that. I was so overwhelmed with the feeling that I just tried, that I just did it, that I got it out of the studio, up onto the walls, and this was the moment where I felt that peace. The only catch in all of this is that I had a full-time job. I was working well over 40 hours a week at a startup in Silicon Valley. I was the design lead at a startup called Mailbox, which is now a part of Dropbox. And at Mailbox, we wanted to revolutionize the way that email was processed on the mobile phone. There was a small team of us. There's nine of us. You guys know the story. It's like you know, you're all in a room. You're huddled. You're working on your project quietly and intently for months, maybe years, and you're just guessing that other people are out there working on the same problem that you're working on. So you're hustling. It's adrenaline-filled and an amazing, amazing experience. So this was my experience at Mailbox. And around the same time, I came across a TED Talk by artist and designer Stefan Sagmeister. And in it, he talks about three different modes of work, a job, a career, and a calling. This really caught me, because I had never thought about them as different things. A job, he says, is something typically done from 9 to 5, something typically done for pay. A career is a system of advancements over time. And a calling is something done for intrinsic motivation, something done regardless of pay. And the question that I ask, and I would ask all of you all today, is which of these do you have? With your projects, with your work, both paid and unpaid? How would they map across these three categories? Around the same time, I came across a, um, a biography about Picasso that was terrific uh, by Ariana Huffington. And she talked about wanting to understand his work and his life, and how the two connected. And she said, and I quote, the more I learned about his life and the more I delved into his art, the more the two converged. It's not what an artist does that counts, but who he is, Picasso said. But Picasso's art was so thoroughly autobiographical that what he did was what he was. This led me to a huge hypothesis. What if our job was our career, was our calling? What if they were all one and the same? What if we could no longer tell where a person ended and the product began? What might this look like for our life? What might it look like for what we create? It was February of 2013 when we launched Mailbox to the world. And as you all know so well, launch day is a special, special moment where all of that hard work comes to fruition. And there's also a lot of anxiety about how the launch is going to go and that everything's going to go well and securely. And our launch was wildly successful. And on that day, I remember looking around the room thinking, wow, this is one of the great highlights of my life. To be a part of a team that has the opportunity to take a question on a post-it note, how might we design email for the mobile phone, and put it all the way out into the fingertips of anyone anywhere in the world who just by pulling out the supercomputer in their pocket can have a new experience in their life with the tap of a button. What an amazing, amazing gift. But in the back of my mind, I couldn't help but wonder what that had to do with my dream of a white room. This was when the crossroads of should and must appeared very, very clearly in my life. Two roads, both equally appealing, but they were different, and I had to choose. I looked at my finances, and I saw that I could buy myself a little bit of time to try to just give it a go, making art full time. And I decided to put in my notice and step away. What I have learned since that day is that all of us arrive at this crossroads over and over 
again in our lives every day. Sometimes it's really big, sometimes it's smaller, but every day we get to choose which way our life is going to go whenever we are posed with a decision. Should is one option that we can take. Should is all of the expectations that others layer upon us. Now, shoulds can be small, like you should go to the mall or you should read this book. Those aren't really the ones I'm talking about, although those do add up and they do um, accumulate over time and they're annoying. I'm talking about the larger ones, that when everything seems to be going this way, suddenly we're off running a different race. The ones that are subtle, the ones that are camouflaged, the influences on our lives that slowly and over time have us um, living our lives for someone or something other than ourselves. Must is different. Must is who we are, what we believe, what we know to be true when we are alone with our truest, most authentic self. Must is your passions, it's your convictions, it's that which you know right here. I was talking to a girlfriend the other day and she said, ah, must feels just like being in love when you know you just know. Must is that which is undeniable and inexplicable for you. And if I have learned one thing in all of this work, it's this. Choosing must is the greatest thing that any of us can do with our lives. So it begs the question, if must is so great, why don't we choose it every day, right? So I was talking with a friend of mine on the phone about how hard this is to choose must because we have to choose it again and again. It's not like if you choose it once on Monday, you're set for life. It's like this thing that we have to re-up again and again and again. And he said, have you heard of a man named Gurdjieff? Now, I had not heard of Gurdjieff. Have you all heard of this man, Gurdjieff? So Gurdjieff was a spiritual teacher around the turn of the century, and he um, was one of the pioneers for a tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram is a tool I've been studying for a couple of years. It's amazing. It's so, so terrific. It's a personality typology tool, and it's the foundation for the Myers-Briggs study. So Gurdjieff was clearly a pioneer and a brilliant, wise human being. And one day he asked his students a question. He says, if a prisoner desires to be free from prison, what is the first thing that the prisoner needs to know? Well, one student raises their hand and says, well, the prisoner needs to get to know the guard. Hmm. Another student raises their hand and says, the prisoner needs to find the key. Hmm, says Gurdjieff. No, if a prisoner wants to be free from prison, the very first thing the prisoner needs to know is that they are in prison. Until they know that, no escape is possible. If we want to get to know must, we first have to get to know should. But should isn't something that we need to fix. It's not something that needs to be tended to. It's just something that we need to have awareness around. And in the book, I talk about a number of different tips and tricks, tools, things you can do in under 10 or 15 minutes um, easy ways to begin to raise our level of self-awareness around shoulds in our life, both receiving them and also, here's the catch, giving them, because we also give shoulds to others. And one of the activities I want to share with you today, um, this is a, a girl on Instagram who just did completed this exercise, and this is what it looked like for her, but it doesn't have to look like this. You could do it in the book, um, or you could pull out a piece of paper and complete these sentences line by line, you should never, you should always, maybe even right now you're like completing them in your mind, you know exactly what they would say. Um, complete these sentences and then go through them line by line and ask them these three questions. The first, let's pretend this is a should. Hello should, where did you come from? When did I first pick you up and begin carrying you around with me? Two, are you really true for me and for who I have become in my life today, now? And three, do I really want to keep holding on to you? This is a powerful question because in this moment, maybe you have something in your life that's really, really hard, but you love that thing. 
In that moment, it ceases to be a should and becomes a must. Or perhaps you have something that you have been carrying around, and we do carry these things with us all the time, every day, into every meeting, every friendship, every relationship. Maybe you have something that you've been carrying that you are ready to let go of. You are ready to set it down. And this is when you say, I kindly let you go, should, because you no longer serve me. And I do not want to keep carrying you around because I want to make space in my life for must. And that's the trick. Self-awareness, it's like a clenched hand around us. The more aware we become of it, the more it relaxes and releases its grip. And as we begin to release the grip of should, we create space in our life for must. So as you begin stepping more into must and becoming more aware of must, three questions will probably pop up for you. And I want to go ahead and preemptively answer them ahead of time before you encounter them. And you might even be asking some of these questions right now. The first, uh, someone came up to me after a talk and, and leaned over and almost whispered, as though not wanting anyone else to hear, said, but what if I don't know what my must is? What if I don't even know where to start? I said two things to this first person. I said, first, cool, it's OK. And two, call your mom. Call her immediately, or someone who knew you when you were a kid. Because nowhere is the essence of must more purely exhibited than when we're kids. Who were you as a child? What did you love? to do undeniably, inexplicably. Call this person and ask them to tell you stories about what you were like. Now, I know it sounds like maybe you could just keep the stories in your head, but I highly encourage you to get out a piece of paper and write them down. I know that sounds a little cheesy, but trust me, it works a lot better. And all of the stories that you hear might not make sense at first, but these stories contain our earliest seeds of must. Who were you as a child? The second question that comes up about must is the practicality of it, the sustainability of it. And it turns out that if you started talking about must and following your passion, a lot of scary questions come up. And I have heard all of them. Some of them are, do I have to quit my job? Uh, how long is all of this going to take? How do I explain any of this to my boss? And one of my favorites, what if I am the boss? These questions are so for real, and we've got to answer them because the brain is just going to keep chattering them in the back of our mind until we respond. The most essential question that I get asked over and over again is this one. But what if doing what I love doesn't pay? It's a terrific question. And it begs a second look at these three columns that we outlined at the beginning, a job, a career, and a calling. One of the amazing stories that I came across is about the life of T.S. Eliot. Now, when I say T.S. Eliot, we all think of him as a writer, yeah? So T.S. Eliot, writing was his calling. And I think because he was so great at it, that's why I would put it in his calling. It came from a very inspired, deep place within him. But did you know that T.S. Eliot was also a banker? Did you know that he had an amazing financial career in London? Somehow this like, fact kind of got glossed over when you're reading about T.S. Eliot. You know, I imagine that T.S. Eliot's career actually created the space in his life for him to pursue his calling. Another author, Kurt Vonnegut, Mr. Vonnegut, his calling was also to write, but he also had a job. He sold automobiles. Kurt Vonnegut sold cars, and I would have loved to have bought a car from Kurt Vonnegut. The book goes on and on and on about all of these people through time. Albert Einstein, he worked six days a week at the patent office in Bern. He was filing patents from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m., six days a week. And during this seven-year period, he wrote his four most foundational papers that became his theory of relativity. What is it about the connection between jobs and careers and callings that actually inspires and creates work? The point I want to make to you all today is that there's no right or wrong way to combine your job, your career, your calling. There's not a superior or an inferior answer. The question is, what do you want? What's right for you, for where you are right now? And this doesn't have to be something that you do forever. It could just be for a while. I guess the key is to be aware. 
where are you, and where do you want to go? So just because you want to find your calling does not mean that you need to quit your job. And maybe you do something for money. It does not make that work dirty. There is dignity in all work. Maybe your calling pays the bills, and you get to do it 24-7. Awesome. That is super, super amazing. Maybe your calling actually costs you money. Maybe it doesn't make money at all. So you pursue your job Monday through Friday, and you pursue your calling on nights and weekends. Cool. The question I would leave you with around money and as it relates to your life, because we all have to make money if we want to live on planet Earth, is what is right for you? What is right for your life? I would take on a designer's mindset, an, um, a beginner's mind, and begin thinking of these things as prototypes and play. Start playing with different combinations of them in your life. Begin seeing what happens when you input different things in different places. Things will get terribly exciting. The, one of the great stories that I came across was about the life of Philip Glass, the composer, um, who lives here in New York. So cool. You know, when you're walking around the streets, you always wonder, like, am I going to just like, bump into Philip Glass? Anyway, so Philip Glass, um, I've been very curious about his life and his work, and I came across an interview about him. And in this interview, he said, while working, I suddenly heard a noise and looked up to find Robert Hughes, the art critic of Time magazine, staring at me in disbelief. But you are Philip Glass. What are you doing here? Well, it was obvious that I was installing his dishwasher, and I told him I would soon be finished. But you're an artist, he protested. I explained that I was an artist, but that I was sometimes a plumber as well, and that he should go away and let me finish. The third question that comes up again and again is about space. But what if I don't have space in my life for must? For me, my space is my white room. It's where I go to drop into my work, quiet all of the voices. I've been reading a lot of Rilke right now, and Rilke talks so beautifully about the role of solitude and its importance in our lives. And I'm beginning to realize that this white room is a metaphor for me for solitude in my life, where I can go and find that quiet space to think and to be with myself. But what do I do when I'm not in my white room? What do I do when I can't go there all the time? Well, at first I began to panic. Oh my goodness, what would happen? What would happen? And a girlfriend of mine said, well, what if your white room isn't actually a space out there at all? What do you mean it's not a space? I had a dream. I went and found it, and I sat in it. She said, well, what if your white room is just right here, and you can go there anytime you like? Where is your space? Is it a park bench? Is it the dining room table after dinner? Is it a corner of your living room? My friend Sharon is so, so wise, and she called me and she said, I have a new studio, and I would love for you to come and see it. And I thought, I don't know about this studio. I've, you know, I hadn't seen it in her house before. And so I go over there, and in the living room, she has cleared out a space for her studio. And she has marked it off with, with painter's tape, like blue painter's tape, that runs across the floor, up across the ceiling, and back down again. And I just thought this is so brilliant. She had basically created a studio with like a $5 roll of tape from the local store. And on the, on the tape, running the length, all around in Sharpie, it says something along the lines of, um, no judgment zone, no judgment zone. This is Sharon's studio. Do not look at Sharon while she is in her studio. Do not comment on Sharon's artwork. Sharon is a vulnerable artist. I love it. I love it. I can, I can just imagine her sitting in there working while other people are moving throughout the house, imagining Sharon is not here. Do not talk about Sharon. Do not look at Sharon or comment on her work. Where is your space? I think we can get super creative about where it starts and stops, uh, where it exists. But one of the larger things that I found is that people don't have space for it in their schedules. We are so busy. And we are addicted to being busy. Why don't we make space for must? Well, it's because we have a lot going on. And I don't know about you guys, but I really wrestle with my phone. Because when I don't have something going on, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. So 
Maybe it's just about blocking off time in your schedule for must. Maybe it doesn't matter like wherever you are, like the buzzer goes off and you just have to like sit and work for five or 10 minutes. And I guess another suggestion I would offer is an idea of reframing what work even looks like in this sense. It's not necessarily as um, traditional as the productivity that I'm so used to, which is getting things done, checking things off of your to-do list. Working on your must is, is kind of like a different animal. I think it moves at its own speed. And one of the big um, takeaways is when you go to your space and you have that time, what do you do in it? And I want to give a couple of ideas, all which are small actions that you can take to honor that must in a small way today. So perhaps one idea is just setting the timer for 30 minutes and not looking at your phone. I know there are days in my life where doing this would be a revolutionary thought and idea because I'm so connected to all of my technology. Perhaps you just need to go and get the band back together again. Maybe you want to do woodworking. Maybe you want to write. Maybe you need a typewriter. Maybe you need ingredients for your vegan cooking. Whatever it might be, go to the store. Treat that activity as a sacred, productive step in honoring your calling. Perhaps you're just craving solitude. Maybe between work and, and getting home, sometimes I feel like it's, it's triumphant if we can just make it home for dinner on time. And seeing our family, our friends, our loved ones, maybe the one person who's really missing in all of this is you being with yourself. Maybe it's about taking a walk quietly at the end of the day. Perhaps you open to a blank page in your journal and you commit to writing for 15 minutes. Now, if at the 13 minute mark, if you stop thinking of things to say, I would highly encourage you to continue writing, I have stopped thinking of things to say, I have stopped thinking of things to say. Fully write for the full 15 minutes, no matter what. Or maybe you hear a song. You hear something when you're down on the train, or you hear something when you're in a store, some song that seems to stir up silt off of the bottom of something that you don't quite know what. Music is a wonderful, circuitous way of, of guiding and pulling us towards our must. And maybe it's just about sitting down and listening to it, pulling it up and listening to it on your phone. But the best advice that I can give you is from the poet Rumi. If you have your space and if you show up to it day in and day out, if you develop a practice, if you believe that it exists out there for you, and it does, it does. Rumi's advice is the best I can give you. Let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. It will not lead you astray. If you want to choose must in your life, you can, and you can do it today. And here's how. Just do one thing. Take one step towards your must. It might only take five minutes. Prioritize it. Think of it as sacred and do that one thing. I wanted to conclude today with a very, very powerful experience that I had when I went to the symphony in San Francisco. And I had the opportunity to listen to the Hungarian pianist Andreas Schiff. He was playing Bach's French Suites. And I was silently drawn to some strange pull of hearing an analog instrument. There was something that I began to sense, maybe because I spend so much time on screens and connected to all of my technology, I was really just craving to rebalance that in my day to day. And I wanted to hear a full analog instrument. And so I went to hear this piano performance. And it was just one piano on the middle of a stage that was so beautifully lit, nothing else in the room, I mean, the audience and the pianist, but just that piano. And I got a seat in the third row, and I noticed that um, the gentleman who was next to me uh, had come alone, as had I. And I don't know if maybe you've sat next to someone like this man that I was sitting next to. Throughout the performance, it was as though he was receiving 
the music in a way that I could feel. It was connecting with him in such a deep way, at such a deep level, that I could almost experience the music through him. It was so incredible, as though he was vibrating on a different level altogether, just by being pulled and drawn by this music. Curious, at the end, I leaned over and I asked him, so, what did you think? And he said, wow, I have followed his career for years. I have listened to all of his music, downloaded all of his stuff. But this, to be right here in the third row, to be so close that I can literally feel the piano strings vibrating inside of my chest, to watch him play for three straight hours without ever taking a break, all from memory, with his eyes closed. This is to experience something with soul in it. Wow, I said, you must be a pianist. Who, me? He said, no, I can't play a tune. But I often have this dream where I can. Thank you. I would love to take any I must ask this question right now and it can't wait questions. No, I should ask this. I can hear you. I'll repeat it back. Uh, I was just wondering, like, so you have a job, and like you had your full-time job, and like, how do you actually find the like time in the day? Like, how are you finding the time in the day to paint and like sleep and eat and I don't know. I like have a lot of things. It's really taking so much of my time. She has a dog. She has a full-time job. How? It sounds like we have a lot of similarities. We both have dogs and lots of work on our plates. Um, the question is, how do we make time for it? Yeah? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, how do we make time for it? We make time for it. So there's this one line in my book, which is, if we don't make time for the things that we say we care about, consider the possibility that we don't actually care about those things. I believe so strongly that we make time for what we want. And if you really, really want it, you will make the time in your life. Now, I had a gentleman come up to me one day, totally exasperated, maybe in his 50s or 60s, and he said, I really, really, really want to find my must, but I have five kids and a mortgage. How am I going to do this? Is this for other people who aren't me? And I really sympathized with that man because we all have obligations. We all have a long list of things from um, people to take care of, student loans to pay off, um, maybe it's just trying to keep up on paying our rent. Whatever that might be for you in your life, it's real. And we have to honor the reality of the world that we live in. And for this particular man, I gave him one piece of advice. And it's still advice that I follow every day. If you want to find must, find 10 minutes. If you are relentless about a 10 minute a day practice, I guarantee it that the seeds of must will begin to plant and sprout in your life. Now I know 10 minutes is so small, especially like you guys are doing such enormous things like that aren't a 10 minute time frame, right? You guys are like working on things for months and years and I get it. So 10 minutes seems inconsequential, but it's not. 10 minutes every day adds up. And I also suspect that once you start doing something every day for 10 minutes, chances are that it might turn into 12. Maybe it'll turn into 15. 
Now, the reason I felt comfortable stepping away from Mailbox and going into my art full time was that I had started with 10 minutes, and 10 minutes had swelled enormously into every waking minute that I wasn't at work. I was sleeping like a couple hours of a night. There's some, there's, I think there's a Vimeo video of me not sleeping, and I just put on a time lapse video and painted literally from the moment I got home from work until I went into work the next morning. You can actually see like the sun go down, my dog sleep, and the sun comes up, she wakes up, and then I go to the office. Um, and I was putting in so many hours that it was no longer sustainable for me to do both. I needed to sleep and I needed to take care of my body. So um, that's when I decided I was gonna give it a go. So I would say once you begin putting in substantial hours into your um, uh, calling practice, whatever that might be, I would say look at how you might get creative about your time. And I have yet to meet a team at any company that isn't interested in figuring out how to um, enable your passion, your deepest passion, how to figure out a way to make that work. The trick is that a lot of folks just don't know exactly what that is and what it looks like and what it demands of their schedule, of their time, and what it might mean for their projects and their team. But the chances are that if you're finding deep, deep, deep fulfillment in something that's outside of your day-to-day -day work practice, you will get to a point where those things might begin to become closer together. They might begin to bounce off of one another. You might have tremendous amount of energy from uh, more what I call your calling work that actually begins to then revitalize and juicing up all of the things, juicing, that's not a word, juicing up all of the things that you're doing in your day to day. Um, I just was having breakfast with a friend this morning who found that that's the case. He's got like 80% client work, 20% personal work, and the 20% of his personal work puts so much juice in into all of his uh, client work, and all of his clients are thrilled. So um, in, in the same TED Talk with Stefan Sagmeister, he talks about what's now, I feel like, a more common cultural idea where if you take uh, retirement, you know, let's say retirement at the end of life is, what, 15, 20 years, 10, whatever that might be, and you were to take those years, let's say it's 10, you were to take your retirement years and maybe take seven of them, and what he does, it's a great little diagram. You like see the UI, it's like 10 years, and it lifts out of the end of the life. And then the seven of those years, you know, kind of hover above the rest of his life, and it's like they drop in, they slot, almost like milestones on a marathon race. And so what he does is he works for seven years uh, with his company, Sagmeister and Walsh, which is here in New York. They work for seven years, and then they take one year off. Seven years, one year off. The whole firm stops working for one whole year. And they all go and pursue personal projects. Like one year he made all these t-shirts about dogs that were like attacking him while he was walking around in Bali. And then he turned them into little robots. And then these little robots were like, and he made a video. Like what does any of this have to do with anything? Well, he played, he was playing. He was stepping into spontaneity. He, you know, it's like that scene in the Matrix where he's you know, dodging all of the bullets. Um, he was just playing and dodging bullets and having a really fun time dancing. And he came back from that work. And then after, for those next seven years, you can see fragments of those personal projects inspiring massive global brand projects. It's terrific. Anyway, um, that's a cool one to look at. If you, if, if you begin to um, step into that space more fully, it will begin to sprinkle across everything else that you're doing. So check out perhaps the, the TED Talk by him. It's terrific. Thank you for asking. Great question. There are so many smiling faces in here. Hey. It's really nice. Hey. So many of these must stories are from artists. Mm. Are there musts that aren't art? I mean, I just seen, yeah. Yes, there are musts that aren't art for sure. And uh, in the book, I largely focus on artists because I feel like there's something about art that steps into the realm of poetry that um, is inspirational as I think about my work and my life. Um, but there are many stories that are outside of creativity and outside of art, although I would argue that they're still art. So one story that comes to mind is um, three young entrepreneurs in San Francisco. They had this idea after their landlord jacked up their rent and they couldn't afford it. They were fresh out of art school and they were not making very much money. They couldn't afford to keep their apartment and they thought, 
well, what if we began renting out our couch and charge people for it? Maybe we could make money. There was a huge design convention coming to the city that weekend, and they decided, what if we could get a lot of people to rent out their couches? What if we could get them to inflate mattresses on the floor? So they built a little website in like 24 hours, titled it airbedandbreakfast.com. They all got inflatable mattresses. They passed them out to all these people. All of these design conference attendees who were coming to the conference suddenly had accommodations because San Francisco was maxed out. And they all slept on airbeds and were given cereal in the morning breakfast. So this is obviously the early story of Airbnb. And what ended up happening was a repeat performance of metaphorically, their rent getting jacked up. They continued to rent out their space. Other people continued to do the same, but the site wasn't making any money. They looked to go raise a round of investment, and people didn't believe that their idea would catch on. They didn't think it was good. And so they couldn't raise any capital. They couldn't raise any money. And they were at a crossroads. Um, you should quit. You should close up shop. You should not continue to go into credit card debt for this air bed and breakfast silly idea. And the founders all sat together and they said, we have to do it. It is necessity that we do this idea. And the Democratic National Convention was just around the corner and they decided, well, if we are the air bed and breakfast team and we're really good at air beds, why don't we get really good at, at breakfast? So they decided to make a limited edition 500 series box um, breakfast cereal. And they made it all around the Democratic National Convention and they called it Obama O's, and they put a cartoon illustration that I think Joe did on the cover of um, the cereal box. I and mean, they literally hacked the whole thing together. They found an Oakland cereal producer um, who made kind of like label-free cereal. They put them in all the boxes that they had printed and made, and they signed and numbered all the lids. Now, oh my gosh, you can't even get these things anymore. Um, and they decided to uh, advertise Obama O's with their apartments. And the overnight, the boxes became collector's items. They were on CNN, they were on Good Morning America, and all of these people began buying their limited edition art cereal boxes. Well, they made some capital pretty quickly. And they actually were able to fund their business until they raised their first round of investment. So, must. It, um, I would say that must is the backbone of all of the most enduring startups coming out of San Francisco. Look at all of the legislative battles that Uber is facing. No, we, we have to do this. We must, must, must. I mean, I think, I don't, I, I don't know that this stat is correct, but there's something like there's a cease and assist out for Uber since they started in like 2012 or 2013. I think like personally, Travis, the CEO, has like over $400 million levied against him because of the cease and assist because they keep operating. Now, I have a feeling that they've probably worked something out by now, but I mean, he should quit. He should stop. And he said, no, we, we got to do this. I want to do this. And they're rolling it out everywhere around the world. So um, I would say must is at the backbone. And, and Rilke uses this word. He says, um, when you, a, a young poet says, how do you define what good looks like for a poem? And Rilke says, well, what a wonderful question. How do you say that a poem is worthy or unworthy? And he said, well, I think it comes down to one factor. He said, I think it comes down to this. Did the work emerge from necessity? I would equate must with necessity. And whether it's a painting that you must do, whether it's um, a, a, a course of study that you must do, whether it is something um, that makes sense or not, it is something that you inexplicably have to follow. Um, and somebody passed me a note. I got passed a note this week in St. Louis at the end of an event. And I opened it up after my talk. And it just said these four words. Stopped me dead in my tracks. It said, your must chooses you. I thought, wow, wow, he really gets it. I think it, it does choose you. And it's about um, deciding to begin to have a conversation with it and figure out uh, what that's going to mean and how it's going to impact you and your work and your life. Wonderful question. Thank you. Maybe time for one more. And then I would love to sign or personalize any of your books um, or answer any questions one-on-one -on -one as well. Hey, 
Uh, I just want to thank you for the inspiration that you give us, uh, that you just gave us right now. And uh, you're one of the best speakers I've ever seen. But thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I would love to end on that. Thanks.